Hello, folks, we'll begin in just a minute. We're waiting for people to zoom in. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our very special Earth Month event. I'm Lauren Kuby, and I'm delighted to introduce our moderator for the day, Clark Miller. He is a professor in the School for the Future of Innovation and Society in ASU's College of Global Futures. He's also the director for the Center for Energy and Society at ASU. Take it away, Clark. Thanks very much, Lauren, and thank you to everybody for being here today. Today, we're excited to be part of a cross-planet conversation about the future of climate action and really the present of climate action. There are 130 or more universities today in over 50 countries, along with civil society, faith-based organizations, and businesses that are hosting regional webinars uh, critical to our future, uh, asking us how we can tackle climate change uh, in the next decade. Climate scientists tell us that we have about 10 years uh, to significantly reduce carbon emissions if we're gonna put ourselves on a pathway uh, to carbon neutrality by 2050 and, and uh, limit our damage to the global environment to less than one and a half degrees uh, Celsius. And so the question for today is how can an ambitious green recovery in our state and cities put us on the way to solving climate change. Uh, if we fail to act, we will destabilize the global climate, leading to extreme weather, droughts, floods, and sea level rises that will be increasingly hard for humans to manage. Today, we're focused on big ideas and big actions for Arizona, and I'm extremely pleased to introduce uh, our three outstanding climate and energy activists uh, who have joined us for the panel today. Uh, as a, after three terms as a council member, uh, Regina Romero was elected mayor of Tucson in 2019, becoming the first woman and first Latina mayor of Tucson, as well as the only Latina mayor in the 50 largest US cities. She's a nationally recognized climate champion who's leading her city to carbon neutrality <clears throat> by 2030. She's proven herself to be a champion of affordable housing infrastructure investment, immigrant and worker rights, and public health as well. Our second panelist is Masavi Perea, who's the Coalitions and Training Director at Chispa, Arizona, part of the League of Conservation Voters. Masavi brings urgency to climate justice issues that affect the Latinx community and creates alliances with groups and communities that are not normally part of the decision-making process. And our third uh, panelist, Today is Nicole Horseherder. Uh, she is a Dine Navajo environmental activist and longtime advocate for an end to extractive energy economies. She's the executive director of To Najoni Ani, a grassroots organization focused on preserving and protecting the environment and charting a new path forward for the Dine people as the coal economy fades. We're going to ask each of our panelists to speak, speak briefly. And we will have a short Q&A with each, followed by a general Q&A with all three panelists at the end. So let's turn first to Mayor Romero. Thank you so much for joining us uh, on the topic of the green recovery. Uh, Mayor Romero, in the past few years, we've seen mayors like you step up in the absence of federal action and reflect public demands for climate action. What do you think are the big idea and the big action needed at the city level to get us to climate neutrality. 
Well, thank you so much, Clark, and thank you all for welcoming me, inviting me, and welcoming me to uh, this panel and this really important conversation. Um, you know, I would say the big idea is for mayors like me um, and throughout Arizona to take the lead on climate resiliency and be able to shape the conversation on um, and how we approach climate change. For me, uh, for many years, I have seen the result of a lack of investment in communities of color and, and low-income communities, who, by the way, are the front line of climate change, um, and really, um, really take a look at how we present climate change uh, to everyone, because it's not just an environmental issue, it is a public health issue, and it is an um, equity issue when it comes to uh, the front lines that are suffering from, from climate change. So for us in the city of Tucson, and as I was running for mayor in 2019, I made climate change and, and climate action and resiliency one of my major planks of uh, talking to, to the voters in Tucson. Tucson is the third fastest warming city in the country, and we're following Phoenix. And so we're already um, at the front lines and we're already uh, suffering this concern because of climate change. So it was very important for me to tell our voters in Tucson that, that I, if they elected me as mayor, I was going to work uh, to make Tucson a much more sustainable, resilient city, and that we were going to create a climate action plan that had with an equity lens uh, to it. And so uh, the big idea is just that, right, for mayors to lead on this, because we have not seen um, um, any statewide um, elected official lead on it. Thank goodness that we have the Arizona Corporation Commission and we have super strong voices there now. Uh, but unfortunately, the state legislature is trying to take control of what the uh, Corporation Commission can lead on. Um, but here in the city of Tucson, we passed a climate emergency with tangible goals by 2030. Um, with um, EV goals and how to deal with waste and um, how to look at internally the city of Tucson, how we do business and uh, externally what will make a difference. And so electrifying our, our, our transit system, our bus fleet um, and our um, car vehicle fleet in the city of Tucson is a huge um huge part of our plan. And then the million trees by 2030, right? Um, uh, being able to set those goals is important for our, for our city and bringing in the private sector to be responsible for, um, along with government, to be responsible for climate change and climate action. Um, so our million trees campaign will be an opportunity and electrifying our, our bus fleet and vehicle fleet in the city of Tucson will be uh, a huge public-private partnership. Um, but I'm really happy uh, about where President Biden is going in terms of the American Jobs Plan because it it is a it is a plan to um, um, for a green recovery in in our country. Thanks. That's great. Um, what, from the citizens' perspective, from the residents' perspective uh, of Tucson, um, what are things that you're either uh, asking uh, people to do to accelerate climate action in their own lives, or are you seeing from your residents that get really has you excited? I see from my residents, from the residents here in the city of Tucson, that they are all in. Um, the city of Tucson Mayor and Council this past year in 2020, when we were going through this horrific pandemic with COVID-19, um, our citizens were open to Mayor and Council creating a green infrastructure fund 
that charged our um, water customers a little bit. And those that use more water were charged more. So it sends a conservation signal. And the Green Infrastructure Fund will help us plant trees, but also create green infrastructure to help remediate stormwater in the city of Tucson and take advantage of that stormwater, harvest it, and um, help us plant trees using stormwater in the city of Tucson. So our residents are all in, not just by saying, hey, this is what we want, Mayor, <laughs> but by actually also paying into the green stormwater infrastructure fund that we created. Um, and, you know, and in, in, in terms of wanting to participate in our Million Trees initiative, our Million Trees by 2030, um, you know, we, we just hired an urban forestry manager to help us lead that effort, the Tucson Million Trees effort. And, um, you know, and in, in also making sure that the mayor and council in, in huge polls that we've done um, of our residents, um, our residents want to see investment in transit and other forms of mobility and uh, want to participate in a green economy. So our residents are ready. They are willing to pay for it. And um, I, I, I couldn't be more proud. We are in a very good place right now, especially with the Biden administration, to be frank, um, that we can actually tap into um, federal funds to green our infrastructure and um, continue pushing for uh, transit and uh, other types of mobility. EV, right? You know, being able to create an electric vehicle um, infrastructure plan in the city of Tucson, and then being able to go back to our federal government and saying, hey, we have these, this strategic plan. Um, we are seeking funds uh, to promote electrical electric vehicle usage in our city. So lots of really good things happening. Um, I'm very excited for, for what Tucsonans are demanding for their mayor and council to do in terms of policy for climate action and resiliency. That's great. That's really great to hear. Can you say a little bit more about your EV goals and how people are responding to that because I think, you know, I mean, I think transit is critically important and I'll give you an opportunity to talk a little more about that too. But in these big desert cities, yeah. transit is only one piece of the puzzle and we've got to think about that electrification of the vehicle fleet. Absolutely. Um, our goal is to, um, to reach carbon neutrality by 2030. I know it's a very ambitious goal um, but it's a multi-pronged approach um, that is really needed, as you say, right? So um, it's needed in order to be able to um, look at every piece of what we do as a government, as a jurisdiction. Like I said, we have goals for our um, environmental services and um, uh, waste department. We have goals for our water department, which the city of Tucson own, owns our water utility. Uh, we have goals for our uh, transportation and mobility department. And um, we have goals for our residents, right, too. Um, and so if we layer the approach of how we reach uh, carbon neutrality. It's not just our transit system, but it's, it's our water systems. It is our environmental services and, and a waste um, department. And so all with the climate emergency that we approved last year in September, it sets very well-defined goals on how we reach carbon neutrality. And this is, this is the EV portion for our, uh, for our residents, right? A lot of residents want to purchase an electric vehicle, but we don't have the infrastructure to be able to provide that service to our community. So pretty soon, um, 
uh, either in April or May, I'm going to be asking my colleagues to approve a um, an EV infrastructure and strategic plan so that we are ready to go as a city. So when um, the American jobs plan passes, <laughs> um, the city will be ready with our infra EV infrastructure and strategic plan to be able to apply for funds, uh, federal funds to create an EV grid in the city of Tucson and encourage residential, commercial, um, and out and about, right, throughout our community to have um, EV infrastructure for our residents to, to be able to purchase electric vehicles. And this is in partnership with Tucson Electric Power, right? It's We're not doing it alone. As I said earlier, the responsibility to act on climate um, should not fall on the shoulders of just government. It should be a, a responsibility that corporations and the community, as well as governments, uh, plan for and carry together. So I appreciate that the state level institutions in Arizona have not been the most supportive uh, on this issue. But if you had one priority uh, for them that would really help Tucson as it took action on climate change, what would that be? You know, that's a wonderful question. And um, <laughs> unfortunately, something that I, I don't um, venture into thinking about a lot because of the current posture of the state government. Um, and, and that's, you know, that's, that's very unfortunate. I know that I am speaking with other elected mayors throughout Arizona, so that such as many issues that we know, cities usually start <laughs> the process and, and then federal or state governments catch up in terms of the needs of what we need to do. Um, so I am working with other mayors across Arizona uh, to highlight the need for climate action and building resiliency uh, through infrastructure. I actually believe that if we're smart about it, it will be good for our economy um, to create a, a green recovery and green infrastructure and uh, build the green new jobs, right? The high tech green jobs that we need to create, especially here in Arizona, that we enjoy 300 and what, 60 days of sunshine throughout the year. There is no reason why the state of Arizona shouldn't be our partner as mayors and cities. Um, but I would say that, that the first step that the state can take is um, thinking about green infrastructure as economic development. Um, workforce training and green infrastructure is where I would say the state could really play a big role in supporting um, climate action and resiliency. Seems like there ought to be an opportunity for an alliance between the cities and the, and the state on um, electric vehicle manufacturing where we've already seen some investments Right. here in Arizona on the solar industry and how we grow and expand the solar industry. Those ought to be obvious. Yes. Uh, so anyways, um, <coughs> uh, the, so, you know, in thinking about, you've, you've already mentioned the EV infrastructure opportunity for the Build Back America plan. Um, assuming it passes or <laughs> if it passes, what, what are your other priorities for, for how you see Tucson benefiting from those investments? Well, um, the uh, American Jobs Plan has, um, I mean, it's a really comprehensive look at how we recover and how we invest um, in our future and smart and green infrastructure into the future. So. I get very excited when there's funds in that uh, jobs plan for continued transit um, and electrifying our transit fleets. Um, 
for example, here in the city of Tucson, when I first started in um, December of 2019, in January, we applied for a um, for a planning grant to create bus rapid transit in uh, a couple of our major corridors in the city of Tucson. And so um, the availability of transit funds to be able to use electric vehicles for bus rapid transit or to expand our streetcar, which by the way, is also an investment in the opportunity for infill development and creating density um, in our city. We saw it with the, with the first leg of the streetcar that we worked so hard on here in the city of Tucson. And so we've seen um, more than a billion dollars in private investment in our downtown, in our west side, 4th Avenue, and wherever our streetcar passes through because, um, because you know, there's that transit system that will not move. Um, and so for me, it's very exciting to see some funds for, um, for, uh, for that infrastructure for our transit system, for mobility and uh, for uh, planning and development for cities for, I mean, there's so much in there that I'm super excited about and um, that we, the cities in Arizona should um, prepare and plan for so that we can be ready if they are grants out there with the American Jobs Plan that we can go out and prove that we need to be invested in as a southwestern city in America that is so car oriented. Um, we, we really need to work together as Arizonans um, to, to tap into those funds uh, that, will, that will move the needle on what climate change uh, and a warming climate here in the Southwest is doing to us, especially because water is such a precious resource here in Arizona, and we've got to be able to protect it for future generations. Um, before COVID, we saw youth uh, all over the country um, making decisions about their lives uh, to settle in places that had good transit options, mm -hmm. uh, to, to look at alternatives to mobility that didn't involve owning an automobile, there's been such a reversal among some age groups uh, uh, in during the pandemic uh, of people moving back out to the suburbs and back to car intensive kind of lifestyles. Has, has that happened in Tucson? Has it happened with the youth or do you still, still see a passion for densification and alternative mobility for a green future? The city of Tucson, we kicked off, uh, when I first got elected, we kicked off a uh, transportation and mobility poll that I just mentioned earlier. And uh, in that poll was a massive um, opportunity for Tucsonans to give us input as to what they wanted to see in transportation and mobility infrastructure. And what we heard from Tucsonans is that um, they don't want us to expand roads. They want us to fix the roads we have and create uh, mobility options, right? For pedestrians and for cyclists, they want much more option and options and investment in our transit system. Uh, they get excited about the possibility of um, uh, a smart city technology so that we can use smart city technologies to move people across town um, within the city of Tucson. And so we saw that. And then we also saw the young people with a climate, um, climate strike and asking the mayor and council to pass a climate emergency to create goals that would get us to our carbon neutrality so sooner rather than later. And so we, my office, um, uh, involved the youth in our conversation. And as we were creating our um, climate emergency, youth played a huge role 
in creating that language. And so I am very um, optimistic about youth still wanting to live, work, and play in a transit-oriented development um, city. So the climate emergency declaration has obviously been important for the kind of politics of Tucson. Um, how has it helped you uh, partner with other cities around Arizona? Uh, and is it something that you see as valuable for other cities to be under, you know, following your lead on that? Uh, or is it something that is kind of unique to the Tucson experience? No, actually, as a matter of fact, I think Tempe has an amazing job creating a, actually Tempe and Flagstaff are ahead of Tucson in putting together their climate action plan. And we have used Tempe's, my sister, Lauren Kuby, uh, council member Lauren Kuby uh, has been amazing in terms of being a, a resource for me and for the city of Tucson. So we are emulating what Flagstaff and Tempe have already done in terms of creating a climate action plan. And we're starting off, we're kicking off. Um, and the mayor and council put uh, aside a quarter of a million dollars to be able to create. Last year, when we're going through a pandemic, this is so important to us. And so um, I see a lot of, uh, work in partnership with other cities in Arizona. As a matter of fact, I am coordinating a uh, an Earth Day uh, message and coordinating events throughout Arizona with other mayors in Arizona to be able to say, hey, mayors are taking the lead in uh, climate action in this state. And so um, Hopefully you'll soon be seeing some messages from mayors throughout Arizona to coordinate, talk to each other and see how, I've always felt that there's a power in unity. And so um, we're hoping that we can hold hands amongst mayors in Arizona and help lead the effort and really try to convince the state legislature and the governor to, um, to see climate change um, and see the facts in terms of the science and, and then see it as a possible, even economic issue for Arizona that we can get ourselves into uh, leading in, um, in, uh, in solar energy and, and other, um, like you said, you know, the, the Phoenix area already has an electric vehicle um, uh, a company you know, they're building electric vehicles in Phoenix. We here in the city of Tucson are building electric um, uh, self-automated uh, trucks um, by, with Too Simple. We have that company here. We're already creating that infrastructure in Arizona. So we could be leaders in this and it could be not just good for our climate and for water, but also for our economy. Are uh, some of the suburban communities also joining you in those efforts? Uh, we're inviting them. <laughs> they have an opportunity. <laughs> they have an opportunity to join us. Yeah, great. So thank you uh, so much. Uh, it's been a really great conversation. And we'll be back to you for the Q&A. But let's uh, turn now to our uh, second panelist, um, Masavi uh, Perea from Choose. Chispa, Arizona, sorry. And uh, let's talk about uh, climate solutions. Masavi, what, what, are, what are you seeing from, from your perspective? Sure, uh, thank you, Clark. Um, good evening, everyone. I'm Masavi Perea with Chispa, Arizona. And before then I start, I wanna acknowledge uh, and I wanna thank uh, Councilwoman Lauren Covey for inviting me to this conversation, but also I wanna acknowledge that uh, it's uh, an honor to be on this panel because we have people that I that I, I admire. Um, uh, Mayor Regina, Regina Romero, amazing. Thank you, Regina, for everything that you do. And of course, our sister, Nicole Forcerder, for all the work that she does uh, in, in, in that community as well. Okay, so I'm gonna share my screen and um, is, is, 
is 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 everybody able to see my screen? Yes. Yes. All right. Good. So 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 climate for 2020. Uh, and again, Vasari Perea, which is Arizona. And um, what is our big idea for in order to solve this crisis, right? So our big idea is to build an equitable and inclusive environmental movement, one driven by, commu by impacted communities that put people first. That is our big idea, right? And that's something that Ashispa Arizona has been working for the last years. And how we are gonna do it? Well, uh, the very first thing is that uh, we need to be grounded. We need to look down for solutions. We need to look around us, right? among ourselves in our communities for solutions. And also we need to learn from resilience communities, right? Uh, also uh, another value, very important, we need to meet people where they are. We need to understand that, uh, that people communicate in different ways and we need to be humble and we need to be uh, smart in order to listen, to listen what they, what they have to say. Also, we need to call it as it is, environmental racism. That's something that, uh, that has been happening for generations. So, so we need to call it as it is. And, and but also uh, very important, we need to let the community, the community talk. The community have a, a, has a, a lot of knowledge and uh, we need to listen to them. So they need to talk. So what is our big action? The big action that we wanna do is community organizing. We have been doing this in CHISPA uh, starting in 2014. But also the community right itself, they have been organizing in many aspects. So this is what we do, community organizing. So our big action and the how to, right? So what we are gonna do and what we are doing is we will employ a transformational approach to environmental advocacy, cultivating an unconventional accessible and revolutionary movement that meets people where they are. They are. And also we will be acting with courage and conviction, holding decision makers and polluters accountable, targeting systematic, system, systemic challenge and fighting environmental racism. This is, this is part of the CHISPA mission. So how we are gonna do transformational approach to environmental advocacy? Uh, there are three, uh, three very important components, right? Community engagement, education, and civic engagement. Those are very three components that we need to uh, take care of it. One, community engagement. We are gonna engage the community, right? Who who's been the most affected. We are gonna engage community who normally no one else reach out. We are gonna engage community that, uh, that they are suffering the consequences for, for what is happening, for climate change, for, for everything that is happening, right? So our group of mom and kids, they, they have been in the front lines. They have, they have been the face of Chispa Arizona, but also they have been inviting and engaging people that again, normally no one uh, is inviting to the table. So we are gonna meet people where they are. Right, so we are gonna be uh, working with um, popular education, right? Giving real examples of life, right? Um, on, on this picture, we can see what we call the windmill, right? So the, the four uh, areas that she's Arizona works is clean air, public land, democracy, and building capacity. And the, and the way how this windmill moves is, is through the committees, committees, the people, uh, if you see every uh, uh, green arrow, that's a, that's a committee, that they are working in the community, pushing for a uh, CHISPA agenda. Second part, education. In order to, to educate our community, we have to relearn history. We have to acknowledge, right, that there are communities who have been suffering the most for many generations. So the, the first thing that we need to do is, is decolonize our mind, right? And acknowledge that we are living in a stolen land and we need to learn from these communities. That is also part of the education. 
civic engagement, another, another important component, right? Since Arizona in 2018, we registered over 30,000 new voters in the areas of Maricopa County, Tucson, and Yuma. And, and, and our plan, it was to do the same in 2020, right? Unfortunately, because COVID-19, our plans changed, right? And, and in order to be safe for the staff and the community, right? We did something different. However, we were able to register over 9,000 voters right, while our communities face a worldwide pandemic. This great accomplishment is a reflection of the interest we hear in our communities of being more civically engaged. And, 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 and our next, uh, um, oops, 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 what happened, what happened? Okay, my apologies. No worries. Okay. Okay. So uh, we, we keep doing this, civic engagement. So uh, our big idea for 2021 and, and, and 22, the Chispa Arizona Civic Education Pro Program, Plantando Semillas, Planting Seeds, focusing and empowering, mentoring, and providing civic opportunities to the youth in our community. So we are creating a program, right, a youth program that, uh, with a curriculum, uh, with a curriculum that will include seven steps: relearn, learn, vote, engage, debate, testify, lobby, create, and lead. There is a misconception that civic engagement is just registering people to vote, right? However, it is important that, to do that, right? And it's important to protect our right to vote. It's important to stop uh, all these anti democracy law. However, we need to understand, right? What are we voting for? We need to engage. We need to debate. We need to ask. But also we need to challenge to our elected officials to create. And mostly for youth, they have the right and they have the challenge to lead all these changes. So this is something that civic engagement is, is doing. And, and of course, this is this is led by another amazing woman, Nicole Morales, who's our director of civic engagement. We will act with courage and conviction, right? Again, she's Arizona is an organization led by, by amazing Latinas women, right? We, we just went to a transition from an amazing leader, Laura Dent, to now to uh, uh, Vianney and, and Dulce Juarez. They are the, the new co-director for Chispa Arizona. But we have to call it as it is. We need to go with, with the elected officials, right? And tell them we need to, we need to make a change. We, we, need to, we, call, we need to call them as it is. Uh, we need to have more democracy in the energy issues. And, and, and only we are gonna do that with courage and conviction. And the last thing, uh, which is also very important, right? We need to fight environmental racism. There is no environmental justice without racial justice. I think Black Lives, Black Lives Matter movement, they have reminded us that we need to put also a sense of urgency on, on these issues. So Chispa Arizona, right, um, is something that we have learned is that uh, environmental is very intersectional, right? So we need to be working in many different issues, but, Again, we need to fight environmental racism and we need to fight racism in all the faces. So we need to, again, learn, right, from black history. We have to learn from those communities who have been on the front lines, you know, since the beginning of the times, right? So this is my presentation and this is the amazing team of Chispa Arizona, right? Uh, and and um, we are always, always welcoming people so if you want to join us, please go to chispaac.org and you can join the movement and you can join uh, the work that Chispa Arizona is doing. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you, Ms. Avi. That was great. Um, I, uh, you know, the Biden administration has identified uh, an equitable energy transition as one of its priorities, uh, including specifying that they want 40% of the investment to be made in frontline and environmental justice 
uh, communities. Here in Arizona, what are the priorities for those kinds uh, of investments as you would see them? Sure, thank you for the question. I, I think we are very excited about these new, these new changes, right? And um, something that we like to do is to support clean jobs, right? So those jobs, right, hopefully they are gonna be union jobs, but also those jobs are gonna be in, in our communities, right? I think, um, I think government needs to do a, a, a equity focus. So all these changes, right, has to be focusing in, in, our, in our communities. So the, I think we would love to work with any administration, right, in, in, in equity issues. So I think that's gonna be the, the main topic where, where the Biden administration needs to work on it. Um, thanks. Uh, I saw in one of your slides uh, a banner uh, that said, I think, our communities deserve renewable and affordable uh, energy. Uh, what? Sorry, I hit the wrong button. What, what, um, what are the challenges to making that happen? Uh, in the communities that you work with and and how could cities uh, or other actors help support achieving that goal? Yeah, no, that's a very good question and that's a very good topic. Uh, as we know, right, uh, there are right now electric cars, uh, there are right now solar panels, you know, and, and that's good. However, I think people who are able to, to have those, those most of those people or that community is a, a privileged community, right? So how can we bring those uh, good effects of environmental uh, issues to, to our communities, right? So how can we bring uh, solar panels to people who live in apartments, for people who rent houses? How, they, how can they get those benefits, right? So we talk a lot about clean energy. Right, and, that, and that's, that's very important. However, we need to talk also about affordable, clean energy, right? I remember uh, when I, di I did start working for CHISPA back in 2015, my background that I'm a, is a labor organizer, right? So I remember that I first meeting that I went and you know, I was driving my, my 4F150 and, and most of the people who was on the meeting, like people were driving uh, uh, electric cars, right? So I was like, man, I would love to, to have a car like that, but I, I cannot afford it, you know? So I think that's something that community is saying, right? Tesla are amazing. Uh, electric car are amazing, but we need to think in our communities how they are gonna be able to benefit also from, from that, right? So, so we need clean energy, but we need affordable energy as well. Are there places here in Arizona uh, or more broadly that uh, you, are looking to as models for how we could do that better? Um, no, I know that there are a lot of intentions. You know, I know that uh, yeah. that a city of Tempe is moving the needle in, in, that, in that sense. I know that the mayor of, of Phoenix also, she's interested and, and well, we have the city of Tucson as well, right? Modeling in, in, in all these efforts. You know, but uh, and, and that's that's very good. But uh, something that I would love to see is in our community, South Phoenix, right? Uh, we would like to see uh, uh, solar farms in Maryville. You know, um, I mean, in, in Central Phoenix or South Phoenix, we can see a lot of empty lots. There is a lot of opportunities to do something with those empty lots, and 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 we are not only we are going to be affecting the heat islands. Iceland, but also we are going to be bringing affordable energy energy to our communities. Um, <clears throat> what um, you you brought up the topic of uh, racism, and it's obviously a critically important topic for our country at the moment to uh, grapple with. As as you look at sort of on the ground issues related to 
climate change and environmental action uh, in, in the communities that you work with? What are some of the biggest ways in which racism is an impediment uh, to fixing those issues? Well, we live, we live in a society, right, that has been funded by, by racism, right? So, so still, there is many things that we need to do, right? So when, when I start organizing with the Latinx community, Latinx community, you know, uh, sometimes there is a misconception that they just care about a few things, right? That they just care about the immigration reform or good jobs. However, our community being very intersectional, we care about many things, right? Uh, so we need, to, we need to stop police brutality. We need to bring health uh, to our communities. We need to have better education. We need to have good jobs, right? So, so I think it's a, it's a mixture of all these issues, right, that, that we need to work on it. And the environment is, is on the, it's on, it's on the middle. Right, because if we don't have good uh, environment, we are not going to have good health. If we don't have good health, we are not going to be able to educate us, to work, you know, to fight for all the issues that we are working. Right. So I think we, as an environmentalist, we have the opportunity to bring the community together in all these issues that are affecting our, our, our communities. Yeah. Great. Thank you. I wanna turn now uh, to our third uh, panelist, uh, Nicole Horseheader, and uh, ask Nicole uh, to, um, you know, now that Navajo Generating Station has closed and other coal-fired power plants in the region are soon to follow, your vision of a more sustainable energy economy, one powered by wind and solar, is coming more clearly into view. What is your big idea and big action for a just transition. Yeah, so can everybody hear me? Can you hear me? We, we can hear you, yes. Okay. Hi. Um, I would like to actually start with the action, if that's okay with you. My big action item, I think, and I have a lot of action items, but uh, it relates directly to the work that I'm doing right now. And I'm sorry, I, I should introduce myself first. Um, I'm Nicole Horseherder. I am the director of Tona Jona Ane. I am based on Black Mesa, which is in Northeast Arizona on the Navajo Nation. And I've lived here all my life. And um, I came back, here to this place back in 1998 after I got my degree in linguistics from the University of British Columbia and um, tried to set up a, um, try to um, build a home and uh, it's that's up now. But the thing that really um, uh, got me into this work was the fact that um, all the springs and seats near my home no longer existed. And it was a mystery to me why they were not there anymore. And so then I started searching for the answer and I was able to find, um, put a bunch of pieces together through the help of USGS and other studies and found out that industry, the coal mining uh, in particular, and the associated power plant, the Navajo Generating Station, were the source of all the declining springs and seeps and the disappearance of many um, springs and seeps across Black Mesa. So um, fast forward to today, we continue to engage um, Navajo leadership and more recently, uh, Arizona state leadership and um, my big uh, action relates to the Arizona Corporation Commission and the utilities that 
um, were the previous owners of the Navajo Generating Station, and that is to push the utilities to adjust an equitable transition. And for many communities, that means many different things. But for um, communities like mine, which is um, impacted by coal and has faced and has um, experienced a lot of environmental destruction um, of not just the land, but the air and the um, water. I think that giving back to communities that have been the source of the tremendous profit and growth and prosperity of these utilities, I think is the right thing to do. It, it really speaks to a moral and ethical obligation instead of so much a business type of obligation to, to the nation. Um, I just, um, you know, um, our, our work began about 20 years ago um, and uh, we created an organization called Tuanajana Ane and the organization, uh, the name translates translates to um, Sacred Water Speaks. And we began our work as water protectors. And the rest of Arizona um, always talks about, people in Arizona always talk about being in a water crisis. But let me just tell you a little bit about something maybe most of the audience may not know. And that is that for nearly 50 years, 4,400 to 6,000 acre feet of pristine groundwater was used for the coal mining operation. For that same amount of time, the coal that was dedicated from Black Mesa to the Navajo Generating Station, nearly uh, about 31,400 acre feet of the upper basin Colorado River was completely dedicated, uh, was being used by the Navajo Generating Station. But in order to make that happen, the Department of Interior got involved with Navajo Nation government and persuaded the Navajo Nation to uh, waive its right to use, to, to use any of the upper basin Colorado River water which, which is 50,000 acre feet, you know, well beyond the 31,400 that Navajo Generating Station ha had been using um, for the duration of the power plant. That's 50,000 acre feet of water that borders the Navajo Nation that is within the Navajo boundaries um, that the Navajo Nation had to waive its right to use so the power plant could exist. And in this time, no economic development occurred in which that water could be used. And so a lot of this, the, the stories um, that you hear today about the Navajo Nation lacking water, especially during the COVID crisis, um, is directly related to the amount of water that the Navajo Nation has to, had to forego um, the use of just so that this industry could exist, so that the rest of Arizona could get its cheap electricity and water delivery at a low cost for the 50 years that the Navajo Generating Station um, operated. And so I think it's, it would, if, if the more people knew this history, if the more people knew how much of the prosperity of Arizona was had been shouldered by the indigenous people in Northeast Arizona. I think that if that isn't enough to compel cities and, and, and county leaders to convince the Corporation Commission and convince the utilities to give back to these coal impacted communities so that they can rejoin, you know, so that they can revive the the, the uh, economy in that in those communities, and I think that would be the big action that I would um, lay down before 
uh, the audience today. Um, I think that um, the big idea that I have um, would would be, and and of course, I'm just pulling from one idea that I that I have because um, we're working on so many different strategies at Twinsland, but that is um, that the entire state of Arizona. And um, if I could take a step further that the entire Southwest needs to start acting like it is truly in a water crisis. Um, we, we've got to change the way we do things. We've got to change the way that we are diverting rivers and streams so that we can have things that we think we need. We don't need all the golf courses. <clears throat> we don't need all the resorts. We don't need all you know, to be able to have uh, all the, uh, the bathing and the showering that people do every single day. We don't need to be growing the type of agriculture that uses an enormous amount of water. We need to, to start thinking about our agriculture in terms of what is sustainable here in the state of Arizona. Um, that would be the, the big idea that I have. And it's, it's, it's going to be a lot to, um, for some people who think that this is not possible, but in Northeast Arizona, in my community, on the Dine um, community that I'm from on Black Mesa, we are living now like we're living in a water crisis. Um, just to give you an example, we are dry farmers. We rely entirely on the monsoons in on Black Mesa to bring our corn to harvest. And for years, this method has sustained us. And our corn is very unique in that it is hardy and it has a shorter harvest um, period. However, because of climate change and because of the lack of water and the changes to the hydrologic systems of Black Mesa, we no longer able to uh, plant and bring to harvest our native um, corn. And that's, that's, de that's a devastation to the communities who can no longer feed themselves. So, in the coming years, we're gonna to have to figure out um, a different way of farming. We're gonna to have to incorporate different methods and add strategies to our farming ways so that we can feed ourselves. Um, that's just one example of the changes that communities um, where I'm from are facing today in real time. And I just wish that the rest of Arizona, especially the cities like Phoenix and Tucson would catch up with us and start um, living like uh, water is precious and, and, and that uh, without action today, we're gonna be living in a, that crisis will become more extreme and more severe in the future. Thank you, Nicole. Very compelling uh, action and idea. Uh, so thank you for sharing them with us. Uh, you know, as you think about this action of giving back uh, to the communities uh, that have for so long supported the economic development of this state uh, and received relatively little uh, in return, um, can you Articulate for us uh, what that looks like. What what are the what are some of the priorities? How how could it be done in a way that would be most helpful uh, to you and to the communities? Um, some of the things that we have been um, pushing the hardest here, and it's only because I feel like the window of opportunity is a lot smaller than we think. And that is to compel utilities to come back into the communities and use some of the infrastructure that is now idle from the closure of these coal plants and partner once more, find partnership once more with the Navajo Nation uh, and, and the Navajo government and to 
commit to buying renewable energy on the Nav from the Navajo Nation, um, made by not by you know made by Navajo uh, renewable energy projects. Um, I think in this way we will have a continued partnership. We will be making use of valuable transmission lines that you know they're not going anywhere. They're, they're gonna be there and they're still owned by the utilities. The power plant has gone away. The coal generation has gone away, but the transmission lines are still there. Um, and I think that's kind of the, 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 the biggest focus for me at this time. I mean, a lot of transition efforts need to happen, especially on the Navajo Nation. Um, we've just been reliant on the revenues brought in from fossil fuel for so long that um, it's hard to wrap, uh, you know, the, the minds of Navajo leadership, it's hard for them to wrap their heads around another way of, of making this very important revenue um, back, come back to the nation. Um, so organizations like ours are helping in this way. Um, I think that's um, the, the biggest push right now, but I, I, I just wanna add something really important to that. And that is um, we've, we've um, understand, we understand that the contracts and the leases from the time of Navajo Generating Station, were not necessarily beneficial to the Navajo Nation. You know, there, they were, there was, it was not mutually beneficial, I should say. It was really, um, they were really one-sided um, contracts and leases. Um, for example, uh, back to the water, the Navajo Nation was asked to waive its use of the upper basin Colorado River water for free. In today's time, that's not that's not a mutual um, um, that's not a mutual uh, agreement. That would not be a mutual agreement. There would have to be some kind of compensation for that. And so, for 50 years, the owners of Navajo Generating Station got to use the Upper Basin Colorado River for their operation for free. Going forward those kind of contracts will not, should not be allowed. Those kinds of contracts are, are not negotiable. Uh, the, going forward, the contracts that we need to make sure that there is uh, just an equitable transition for communities such as ours who have been hard hit and have been reliant on coal for so long um, th there needs to be a more level playing field when it comes to uh, uh, writing up the contracts for these projects. There has to be something in it for Navajo. There has to be something in it for the host communities of these projects. And their utilities really need to be more genuine and need to be more uh, forthright when they are negotiating these contracts and really commit to buying that energy and prioritizing these projects in coal impacted communities and in and that means indigenous communities such as ours. I'm really glad you said that. That was, in fact, my next question was gonna be to ask uh, what we needed to do uh, the next time around to make sure that future energy development doesn't have the same kind of colonizing impacts on environments and communities uh, like yours. So thank you uh, for sharing that. We had a question from Hallie Eakin. Um, she uh, asks about the, uh, the notion of growth and consumption in Arizona uh, and our sort of history of it. And, and she asks, to what extent, given your conversations with folks around the state, um, do you think we're ready as a state, and particularly in the urban centers, 
uh, to grapple with growth and its implications for climate change rather than trying to make existing patterns of growth more climate resilient. The thing about climate change and these, these things that are happening in this world today and is that if we don't make ourselves ready, the world will make us ready and the world is gonna make us ready. The climate is gonna make us ready in ways that we are not ready for. The ways that we will make changes in the ways that we don't, don't we're, that we're not prepared for. So always, because we are a species with a conscience and with uh, the ability to think and plan and prepare for you know what's to come, we have to use that today. We, we can no longer say that we are not ready or do you think that uh, um, we're ready for this type of change move? We are, in fact, we're behind. We're, this, these changes and this, this planning should have happened decades ago. And you know, one of the important voices and one of the important um, um, voice in this as we're deciding how we're going to make our changes is the indigenous voice because the indigenous voice brings to the to the table if you will um, a ancient knowledge that is a, every bit as applicable as it is today and you hear it in all the advocacy that we do. And that, you know, what we're doing today is we are draining the rivers so that the rivers don't live anymore. The river has to flow in order to live. But the way the Arizona law is written is you, you use it or you lose it. And, you, and it, this allows for, uh, entities to take every bit of whatever you can from the river and and that way of thinking is is the thinking we have to get out of and that I think is the challenge for people today is to change their mindset to stop thinking in that way of controlling everything and 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 that nothing else has life except the human species, which is absolutely wrong. So I think it's more than anything, change has to happen. It will happen to us if we don't, if we don't meet that challenge and uh, we'll have to change in ways we don't wanna change. And so I think that it's better to put your head around that right now. Thanks, I think that point that you're making about the the kind of public imagination or the public way of thinking really resonates with a, a question that uh, we had from Nalini Chetri. And um, it, she, she highlights that um, if we wanna change those ways of thinking, that, that kind of way that we imagine the world so that we stop thinking of resources as infinite. We stop thinking of uh, stopping the rivers as something that doesn't really uh, uh, impact life. As uh, uh, How do we, uh, as a community on a state level, right? We, that this is not something that we can tackle just with a policy change at the ACC. Uh, it takes all of us participating in a, in a conversation where we learn uh, new things. Masabi highlighted, we have to relearn our own history. Um, what, are the what are the big priorities for you in terms of, of how we can tackle that challenge here in Arizona of changing our imagination, changing our ways of thinking? Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it's a big question. 
<laughs> You're asking me to uh, solve the colonial crisis. Um, I think, you know, I had a conversation with our representative, Tom O'Halloran, one time. And I said, look, Tom, one of the easiest ways that the Navajo, Na you could help the Navajo Nation uh, transition and bring back its economy from this coal plant closure is to give back that 50,000 acre feet. Because even though it's written in the resolution that once the operation ceased to exist, <coughs> that that water shall be returned to the Navajo Nation. And so now the state of Arizona is hanging on to that water and is making, you know, all kinds of um, uh, um, conditions on, 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 on the water. And I told Halloran uh, that this is the easiest, most straightforward way to transition for the Navajo Nation. And he said, you know that the rest, all my colleagues in DC are gonna disagree with that. They don't believe that that water belongs to Navajo. They believe that that water belongs to the state of Arizona. And I just, and I told him, we are the state of Arizona. Stop treating us like we don't belong to the state, which we have uplifted for the last 50 years. That's one thing. Number two, it doesn't matter what your colleagues in DC think, you need to keep talking to them until they understand and they take this type of action. They can't continue to take action on their white constituents because everybody in the state of Arizona votes and that's how they all got in office. But stop just catering to those constituents and start thinking about the rest of Arizona because the rest of Arizona is brown and red and yellow and whatever color you want to make it, but white is not the only color here. So I, you know, it's really important to be, to remember, I mean, what's happening here? I mean, who had to give up? You can't just constantly be writing contracts and reneging on them. It, that's, hence the crisis we are in today. You know, you're driving yourself there on your own you know, we've got some solutions. Uh, we can, if you, if you want to, if you want to get out of this mess, it, it would be a really good thing to really start listening to um, some of the oldest voices and oldest wisdom here on this uh, earth, uh, right here in this state. And so, I think that um, that question is a big big, big question. And I think I answered parts of it already, but it it's everything from getting local leadership in the state of Arizona on the Navajo Nation to act within this, the scope of their positions, but also that the rest of the nation, people themselves really need to do a self-assessment and have a, a change of mind on how things uh, happen here in Arizona, how you get your water, how you get your electricity, that has to change. You have to start knowing where that comes from and you have to start understanding how that's gonna be, how that can be sustainable in the future. That's a really, really important message. Uh, thanks. I wanna bring Masavi and Mayor Romero back into the conversation here at the end, and I want to start, Mayor Romero, with you. And I would say, how do we prioritize uh, the the perspectives and the needs of communities of color, Indigenous communities in this state, as we move forward uh, with uh, city-based climate action? Thank you so much for the question. I want to thank Nicole for centering us in. Um, you know, and where we stand, um, because she is absolutely right that indigenous communities to this land already have the answers. <laughs> um, they really do already have the answers. Their ethic is to conserve and protect Mother Earth. 
And so here in Tucson, uh, we stand on land of the Tohono O'odham people. Um, I have a wonderful relation, relationship with the Tohono O'odham nation and chairman. And uh, we do also have the Pascoyaki tribe. Uh, they must be part of um, our conversation and leading us and um, really make sure that we're centering equity in the decisions that we're making. Uh, because as much as we wanted uh, the coal power plants uh, to go away in Navajo Nation, uh, it affected a lot of people there. It affected the people, um, the native people that live there. And so we have to make sure that when we're making decisions um, to protect Mother Earth, that we're also protecting uh, the indigenous communities uh, that have been here for centuries. And so, um, yeah, no, I, I, I think that um, we have to state the facts, right? The facts are that communities of color are the front line of uh, climate change. And uh, we have to be able to make decisions here in Tucson as a community, Native nations, um, that, will, that will invest in our neighborhoods. So for example, uh, we just saw, and I don't know if you all saw a, uh, the study that came out, I'm forgetting the name of the, of, the, um, of the scientists that, it was a group of scientists that put together that uh, neighborhoods, uh, brown and black neighborhoods in both Phoenix and Tucson and throughout the Southwest um, suffer much more of um, heat island effect. And I think Masabi said this as well. Um, we know for a fact that neighborhoods in the urban core um, are hotter than neighborhoods in more, much more influential areas. Um, and that's not just a phenomenon that happens here in Tucson or in Phoenix or in Arizona. It's throughout the Southwest. And so um, the investment, um, the retraining, the workforce development training, we have to make sure uh, that we're centering it around where the need is and who the front lines are uh, in terms of, of, um, of uh, climate change. So uh, that's what we're trying to do here in Tucson for many, many years. Uh, the city of Tucson and its mayor and council have been leaders, you know, and, and I'm, I'm just going to touch a little bit on, on what Nicole said um, in terms of Tucson and Phoenix and other cities around the state following um, the example of the Diné people. Um, here in the city of Tucson, we've been leaders in terms of water conservation efforts. Um, every resident here in the city of Tucson uh, uses much less gallons per uh, person than every other city in Arizona. And so, <laughs> Uh, we have been working really hard um, to send that conservation signal to individuals and families, uh, to commercial um, uh, customers, et cetera. And now with the Million Trees Initiative or our Green Infrastructure Initiative, we are uh, centering it in neighborhoods that have the highest heat island effect in the city of Tucson. And so that's what we're, we're working on to make it fair, to make it equitable and to push us as a government, but also push individuals and families in our city um, uh, to further uh, get better and better in conservation, both in water, electricity, uh, consumption, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Thanks. I I think that was really helpful. Um, you know, one of the things I've heard uh, from all three of you is the need uh, to invest in our infrastructures in a way that's equitable and that benefits low-income communities, communities uh, of color. And I'm just you know thinking ahead. We know here in Arizona, just to meet our own needs, we have to build many gigawatts of solar energy. And I think 
uh, a lot of people kind of say, oh, well, when, if you're gonna do that, you have to build it out in the countryside, countryside in these giant uh, solar farms. And obviously some of what Nicole was talking about was the idea of building large scale so solar yeah. power plants uh, up uh, on Navajo and, uh, and selling that electricity back to uh, Phoenix and Tucson. But it also seems to me there are opportunities and Masavi was talking about this investing some of that solar and maybe a lot of that solar in community-based projects that would benefit uh, communities directly, that would bring shade into our communities, uh, that could potentially have other kinds of benefits. Uh, what are, Masavi, uh, Mayor Romero, what are you guys thinking about how we can leverage this huge future investment in solar that's coming in this state in the next couple of decades uh, to really benefit low-income communities? Go ahead, Masavi. Thank you. Um, I think, um, again, I don't think that we should thinking in reinvent the wheel. I think there are already communities like in uh, Northern, Northern California um, creating these uh, solar farms where people from uh, a, who are renting people who live on apartments, they are, they are benefit, benefit from, from those. Uh, I think uh, uh, we need to also find a way, right, that uh, these solar farms are owned by communities, right? I know this is going to be a big challenge, right, to try to uh, move out of this monopoly that we have on the electricity in the state of Arizona. I think that is one of the biggest challenges. And I'm uh, very happy to hear uh, Nicole's ideas, right? How to continue having, uh, you know, uh, if we wanna support in this case, like the, the Navajo community, the Diné community, right? To, to continue buying electricity from there, right? Making uh, clean energy. So I think in, in our areas, in our communities, like South Phoenix and West Phoenix, I think we have to create something like that, right? And, 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 and going back to other communities who already has been successful in, in this, uh, in, in, in these uh, actions. Nicole, do you have thoughts about how we can diversify ownership? Uh, uh, I mean, you mentioned it already uh, in, in our renewable energy future. Are there good models that you've seen out there for how to do that? Um, the, the, the thought that came to my mind is, um, you know, the, in, the, in the Arizona Corporation Commission, the ratepayers is the top priority. It is utilities do what is in the best interest of ratepayers. Ratepayers are anybody that get their electricity from these utilities that are regulated by the Corporation Commission. Ratepayers, if they organize, could ask the Arizona Corporation Commission to, uh, to allow more local uh, um, ele electrification and to allow re more renewable energy and takes the control because I really believe utilities have just too much control over how electricity is generated um, on behalf of the people. Uh, I mean, at every turn, ratepayers have to pay for, had to pay for the Navajo generating station, even when the Navajo generating station was no longer operating um, and, and making profit. It was losing money and the ratepayers were silent. And th this is, this is a, process this is a structure in which the ratepayers really really could have a lot of control and and propel this state to move forward faster 
and, and towards a more aggressive clean energy standard and renewable energy standard if they just organized and got together and, and pushed that utility commission to make those changes. Um, that's, that's really what's needed. And um, yeah, let me just add that. Thanks, I think that's great. And it, it really challenges Masabi and, and your community organization. Masabi, you have a task. Uh, <laughs> are, are your communities ready for that? Well, we we are ready. We have been doing this, and uh, and, and we love the challenge, and uh, we love to have community partners uh, as Nicole and as uh, Mayor Romero that they are in the front lines. So yes, absolutely, we are ready for this challenge. But also, you know, we invite people who wants to be part of this challenge, right? So please join any of these fights, right? I mean, I can talk about CHISPA, right? Please join chispaac.org where you can learn like what we are doing and what, what else we are gonna continue doing. Yeah, great. Last uh, thoughts from either of you, just in terms of uh, summing up uh, where you think this conversation, I think this has been a fantastic conversation. I really appreciate your uh, inputs. Uh, and any last thoughts from either of you? Nicole, you wanna go? I okay, think. I was I was on mute. Sorry. Um. Yeah. So I would challenge uh the rest of Arizona to really try to understand where their electricity comes from and where their water comes from. How mm -hmm. do we keep the rivers flowing? And what are some things that we could really without I think that really requires some meditation and some really self-assessment a self-assessment um and you know if if you need if you need help if you need to really understand what's happening I invite you to go to northeast Arizona or um connect with organizations in northeast Arizona to really understand what's happening up there and what those impacts are that I'm talking about. And I think that it would be helpful to understand other fellow um, Arizonans, what they're going through. And I just, um, I think that, uh, that that would be my, my uh, thought that I'd like to leave the participants with. Thank you, Nicole. And I will add to that, that uh, if you wanna protect the environment, we need to fight racism in all the faces that, 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 that there are. So um, I think that's, that's the challenge that I will ask to, to the audience. Yeah, thank, thank you both. Thank you, Nicole. Uh, thank you, Masabi, uh, for a wonderful and stimulating conversation. I often think uh, that Arizona uh, is, um, isn't terribly unique in confronting the challenges uh, of uh, today's world. Uh, many other cities uh, and many other states uh, and regions face the same kinds of issues, but we wear them on our sleeves. Uh, we live in a world that's been created by large technological systems that move our water and move our power hundreds of miles, but we often don't really think about that. Uh, and especially as we enter this realm of climate change and its implications for uh, our communities and our infrastructures, I think that's really gonna challenge us and it will really behoove us, Nicole, to better understand those realities uh, and to grapple with uh, what they mean and to think about how we can live uh, differently. And Masavi, thank you so much for that ending statement. The, um, I have in my role as director of the Center for Energy and Society been thinking a lot about uh, energy transitions and I've really come to believe that uh, our energy insustainability problem and our 
social inequality problems are one and the same. Uh, and that it really is essential that we tackle them uh, together. So thank you both very, very much. And of course, thank you to Mayor Romero as well for joining us. Uh, she unfortunately had to leave, but uh, really appreciate your participation, uh, your wonderful insights uh, today, and your really strong messages to the state about how to get its act together. So thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Clark. Uh, it's Lauren back at you. And just wanted to show you uh, what's coming up tomorrow. We're having climate threats and solutions for Arizona, the cost of inaction. And Mayor Kate Gallego from Phoenix will be leading that discussion and introducing us to a lot of different speakers from the Environmental Defense Fund and ASU. And then I wanna point you to this wonderful event that the city of Tempe is hosting with Chispa and uh, Unlimited Potential, but it's a youth activism and climate action training for eighth through 11th graders. So the city of Tempe is honoring Dolores Huerta. They created Dolores Huerta Day and they're honoring her with a day of organizing for young people. And then, and then Clark, we're gonna see you again on next week uh, on Life After Carbon, Imagining the City of the Future. So thank you so much to the panelists, to Clark for his able moderation. It's, it's not every day we get to spend time, lunchtime with our climate heroes. So thank you everyone. And we'll be signing off now. Thank you. Thanks, Lauren. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.